So, I'm Orville. This is Dave, uh, Reverend Dave Jagger. Uh, Dave has been a, a minister in a local congregation like me for 26 years, and just for the last two years, the United Church has asked him to help all over the region. He goes from Windsor to Tobermory to Fort Erie, pretty much that whole territory. To Oakville. To, and you do Oakville? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he works for our church, helping every congregation he can think through and get inspired about how we use our resources, our personal resources. So I'm going to talk later about what Nancy and I are doing, but uh, he's going to just kind of share some thoughts, and uh, I'm really glad he was able to join us. The other th connection uh, I'll tell you about Dave and I um, we've known each other for a dozen, 15 years, maybe, yeah. maybe as long as I've been here. Um, I was in my office half an hour ago, and we're, we're talking, and we looked at a picture uh, of when I was nominated for moderator and all the candidates, and the next general counsel, three years later, he was nominated for moderator. So we've both gone through that process and I think we're both very happy that we got to stay in local congregations and not work in bureaucracy and structure and all of that. So the other thing in my office, we were looking at pictures and there was a picture of me, um, well, we were talking about the football game last night. He, he watched painfully, watched, he's a Ticat fan, oh. poor guy. Oh. Uh, he watched the Ticat game on TV. I was at it and we got talking about uh, all of that, and I showed him the picture of me with Pinball. How many of you were here when Pinball spoke? And Russ, it, Russ, yeah. Yeah, you were here, you introduced Pinball. So we got talking about all of that. I just love having a minister that I can really connect with and team up with, so I'm very grateful to Dave that he came today. We asked him a year and, and more than a year and a half. Over a year. Yeah. yeah. So this has been a works for, in the works for a year and a half. Dave Jagger, not Mick's cousin, no. but... I haven't got the lips for it. You don't have the lips. No, it moves <laughs> like Jagger. No. <laughs> Doesn't move like Jagger. No. no. Okay. No. no. <laughs> what a lead-in for scripture. <laughs> Whoa. Let's listen for what the Apostle is saying to us in this day and age with words very, very old. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason... Since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God bless these words to our hearing and our doing. just happened. I hit the jackpot. I looked in my pocket and it was just there. I can't believe this. 
oh my gosh, this is, is going to change everything. I am firing at all cylinders. Oh, this is amazing. Can you believe this? It, look, oh, don't drop it, my goodness. Oh. Okay, now, the question is, <laughs> do I share this with my husband? <laughs> do I tell him? I'll figure that out. Yeah, maybe I'll share, but I'm not sure. Amazing. Have you ever had that experience? I will respectfully disagree. <clears throat> what we just witnessed here is, should, could be our reaction every time we walk into this building. What we just witnessed is, should, could be our reaction every time we take part in a program or an activity as part of this congregation, which of course also includes what we're doing right now on Sunday morning called worship. What we just witnessed is, could, should be our reaction every time we open our Bible and read those words. Because what we have just witnessed is how people react when they realize a windfall out of nothing that they have done to deserve it. Which is exactly what has happened to you and to me. It's what we're here to pay tribute to today. So let's think about this and let's think about it together. I got a thing here. Got to remember the thing. Ta-da. Think for a minute about the stories that you know of how people have experienced God's grace before our time. Think about your parents, maybe, or your grandparents, aunts, uncles. My grandmother comes to mind. Think about the friends you knew or know. About all these people. A string of ancestors, both genetic and spiritual, going back, what, 2,000 years? Time and time, generation to generation, it has been shown over and over again that I have and you have done nothing to deserve God's love and God's care. It's the nature of grace. We get what we don't deserve, and we don't get what we deserve. Isn't it true that so much of what you do, and more importantly, why you do it, is because of what you have received from those who have gone before you? Right? Okay, here's the secret code today. This is yes, and this is no. It's true, isn't it? Hey, there we go. They can be taught. It's pure gift. The traditions that have been passed on to us, not just why you cut the end of the ham off before you put it in the oven. You know that story? How many years, or if you haven't told them that one? Why? <laughs> Every Thanksgiving, the family gathers. Ham is the meal of choice. The food is amazing. And every Thanksgiving, as the ham is prepared and lovingly put into the pan and put into the oven before that, about an inch and a half must be cut off the end of the ham.
Finally, after years, the granddaughter, who is now an adult and is doing this, goes to her mother, why do we do this? And mother says, your, mother, your grandmother, my mother, she always did it. It makes the ham amazing. It's the best ham. You got to cut the inch off. Granddaughter has a talk with grandmother one day. Grandma, what's with this cutting the end of the ham off? It doesn't make any sense, but mom says it makes an amazing ham. Why do we do that? Grandma says, oh, that's because I had a small roasting pan. It didn't fit. <laughs> Tradition passed on to us from those who have gone before. What we have received, the why to the way we live. The gospel passed on to us by those who have gone before. Good news shared by Jesus about how much God loves us and how much God has done, is doing, and will do in us and through us. As we heard in that letter to the Colossians, you have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. As I was getting ready for this, and, and I mean, it's been a year and a half, this better be good, eh? <laughs> I was wondering, and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to, if you want to tell somebody besides you, go right ahead, you don't have to, but who was Epaphras for you? Who was the one? And maybe it was more than one because most of us don't get it the first time. Who were those who shared the gospel with you that you might do the same for others? I have a face right here. Maybe you do. Worship, prayer, Justice work, fun, community building activities, faith building activities, programs, the culture of this congregation. Horv and I stood over there this morning and he went, oh yeah, they dropped kids at Graceland. Oh yeah, they did this. Oh yeah, it's here. The faith that you have received, it's the spiritual heritage that you have inherited, a spiritual windfall. Each of you has also received a physical windfall. You're sitting in it. A place for worship. And yeah, I know you can do worship anywhere. I even hear it can be done on the golf course. <laughs> but on a, and, and I mean, when I wrote it, it was, it isn't today. On a cold and rainy day, <laughs> how wonderful to be in a nice, warm building with a good roof, with heat. A building that inspires. You do not see this because you're facing this way, but wow, those windows. A building that invites. A building that is a symbol to the wider community that God is in their midst, that there is another way to live and to be as an alternative to the greed and the individualism that is so rampant in the culture these days especially. A place for study. A place you can come and learn about God's love and about Jesus and about what it means to be a disciple and a church. A place for the children and the youth to hang out and to learn about God's love for them. The United Church Observer focused you, on you folks about a year ago now as having the largest kids and youth program in the United Church of Canada. That's pretty amazing. And sure, staff like Heather and Adam and volunteers like Brad and Greg and Jennifer and Donna and Wendy and Tracy and on and on and on. Plus the leadership and the helpers and the programming are critical. So is being located in a place with lots of kids and youth. But a great facility also makes it possible. It's attractive to new folks, it's flexible, 
it's welcoming, it's safe. Equally as important, though, this is a place not just that you come into in order to learn and grow and do things. It's also a place out of which you go. So that you can do things that make a difference in the wider community. A couple of weeks ago, I was guest preaching for a 155th, no, 255th anniversary. Really old. In a little rural congregation, literally in the middle of nowhere. And above the door, as you walk into the building, in the stained glass piece above their door, it says, come to worship, go to serve. Yeah. Can you think of things you do here that make a difference in the community around you? Remember the secret code? <laughs> what happens here every Friday afternoon and evening? Uh huh. 225 ish people served, almost 300 by the time you include the volunteers, all being changed, all encompassed whether they know it or not, in God's love. All discovering what it means to serve, to be cared for. Your property also includes the memorial gardens, which in and of itself serves as a reminder to what I'm here talking with you about today. To a large degree, what you have and what you are is a direct result of those who have gone before you. Their legacy is your blessing. And that's equally true for your less tangible resources, like reserve funds and gifts and memorials and that kind of stuff. Think of the physical heritage that you have received. A physical windfall. Now, we witnessed at the beginning of this message how people react when they Realize a windfall out of nothing they've done. Whoop! When they experience grace. The difference for you is, though, you know where it came from. You have that bonus. You know exactly where what you have came from. Today, we're recognizing All Saints Day. It's a time to commemorate all who have died in the Lord. And don't get caught up in the saints' word. There's so many layers have been added to that word since its origins. From the days of the first disciples in the early church, the saints were simply the holy ones, which were those who followed Jesus, which was the church, which is us. The heritage that you have inherited, both spiritual and physical, came from those whom we recognize today the saints of this congregation who came before you. People like the Reverends Pritchard and McMillan, Glenn and Pat West, Alf and Betty Oliver, Bill Nelson, Betty Park, and those that perhaps some of you are here today to remember who have died over the last year or so. Don Cornick, Nancy Plum, Gerald Venema, Phyllis Hadley, Robert Charlton, Sally Macher, Bill Rowland, Duncan McFadgen, Ken Sutherland, Jim Walker, Ian Link, and very recently, David Britt and Marlene O'Brien. Their legacy is your blessing. And so it's only right that, you fir that your first and most important response is gratitude, thankfulness. It's why the leadership of this congregation, on your behalf, sends a letter and a thank you card to the families or estate of those who remember this congregation in their will or through some other form of planned legacy giving or memorial. You can't say thank you too often. I have never met anybody who left a church upset because somebody thanked them too much. Gratitude and thankfulness are a great starting point. But I know that gratitude and thankfulness lead to generosity. 
It's one of the really cool things about this job that I've been doing for the last two and a half years or so. I get to see it all the time. I get to see this. I get to work with individuals and congregations, people who realize how much they have been given and are grateful and who want to give in return. Canadian author and icon Jane Jacobs uses these words. All of us, if we are reasonably comfortable, healthy, and safe, owe immense debts to the past. There is no way, of course, to repay the past. We can only pay those debts by making gifts to the future. So in addition to expressing your thanks for those who have gone before you and the spiritual and physical windfalls that you have received from their generosity, today is also a day to ask yourselves, how will I follow the example of those whose legacy is my blessing? One of the best, one of the easiest ways to do that is to be generous and to give. Out of gratitude for the gift of the heritage that you have received, you can leave a legacy. One which will become a blessing for the future saints who will make up this congregation when you are gone. Because that day will come. It's a way that you can be someone else's Epaphras by passing along what you received that they may also share in the inheritance of the saints. And if you'd like to know how you can be generous by making a planned legacy gift or a memorial gift, you can talk to me afterwards. You can talk to Ruth Tome. You can talk to Karen Dobson. You can talk to Bruce Hillier. You can talk to Lindsay Foster. So lots of options. But please consider making a gift that will pass along and become the blessing for those who will come after you. On All Saints Day, these are important ideas for us to consider and important ideas for us to act on. Amen. Good morning again. I want to say thanks to David. Um, I'm really grateful that he is doing this stewardship development work all across the region of southwestern Ontario. I totally believe in all of us finding ways to use our resources all our life long. And we go through stages. There's stages where we don't have a lot to give. And then we get past mortgages and kids' tuitions, and we have stages where we do. But all the way through, I believe we need to find ways to use our resources for the betterment of God's world and God's people. And I believe we can and should do that even beyond our earthly life. Nancy and I are in a transition period right now. Uh, just this year, her uncle in Ottawa, my mom in St. Catharines, have passed on. Uh, interestingly, and to show life's balance, the, the day before my mom's funeral last month, we had a new grandson born in Kitchener-Waterloo. So, uh, circle of life, life is good, all of that. But it, it got us thinking and we are tweaking our will. It is at our lawyers right now. We're going to go sign it on Tuesday. Um, we've had a will for a long time, but our kids are all grown up. And you tweak it every five or ten years. And we started this time by asking ourselves, what are the causes we have believed in and have been supporting over our 40 years together? And... We had not, until this will, we had not named anything other than our family, but this time we're, we're redoing it, and we, we thought of three things right away. We have had a foster child in Haiti, we've had four in a row, through an organization called Compassion, and we have uh, been foster parents. To, it, it takes 10, 12 years for each one to grow up, so now we're on our fourth foster child. So we have listed Compassion uh, of Canada as one of the recipients. Um, uncle died of cancer. Uh, my dad died of cancer. Cancer Society is there. Compassion 
Cancer Society, and Wellington Square. We've named those three in our will. I mentioned uh, this to uh, a younger friend of mine just in the last uh, week, and he said he and his wife have done the same thing. Now, they still got kids in elementary school. He's in his 40s, I think. Um, he's named Wellington Square in his will, too. I was surprised and Im impressed. But I believe in this. I, I really think we, all of us, are blessed so much in southern Ontario. We got to think about ways while we're alive, but even after. How can we support the things we believe in, the causes that we want to further the betterment of the world? So I talked to our board and to our trustees about this and got permission. Here's, here's what I'm wanting to ask. I've been here 22 years. Uh, it'll be 22 and a half on January 1st. And I asked the board and the trustees, could I say to everybody, Nancy and I are naming Wellington Square, I would love it if at least 22 people in this congregation would say, yeah, I'm gonna name the church. I'm gonna name God's work in my will too. So I'm kind of, I'm calling it Challenge 22. I'm hoping that a bunch of you will say, okay, I'll put a codicil in my will and name Wellington Square because we want, we want this place to be strong and healthy and good and have resources to care for people and to teach children and develop programs long after I'm gone and I hope long after you're gone. So I'm hoping uh, you don't have to tell me uh, Karen Dobson. Karen, I saw you. Where are you? Okay, Karen's our treasurer. Keep your hand up. Um, Karen's our treasurer. If you would just tell her, uh, and you can email her in the office or, or call her, and just, you don't have to put in amounts or percentage, just say, Karen, we've named Wellington Square in our will, and she'll keep track. And I'm hoping we get to 22 or more <laughs> uh, that can do that kind of thing. Um, there is a table out here, I think Dave mentioned this, there's a table up at the top of the steps with info how you can do this, there's all kinds of ways you can do it and huge tax benefits, blah, blah. That's way over my head, that kind of stuff. But we've got smart treasurers and accountants and trustees who know how to do that so that everybody wins. Well, I guess the government doesn't win. But you get a benefit, the church benefits, and the people in need get a benefit. So, could I just pray to finish this, and then the band has uh, some more music for us. We can just worship and give thanks to God. Holy One, it's a great morning to be in this wonderful place where your spirit moves amongst us. Let your peace soak in soak into our spirits. Let your love bond us to each other and to people we can't see from here, but we want to love and we want to care for and care about. And let your joy, let your joy carry us as we go through this life and receive your gifts and use them for your good purposes, for our families, for our friends, for your work. Holy One, Holy Spirit, welcome. Thank you. Amen. Not that you aren't already blessed, but before you are officially blessed, um, I was asked to remind you that the prayer team is standing and waiting and expectantly, enthusiastically at the side over there. And so if you have a prayer concern or you want to be prayed for, please, you're welcome to go over there and they will do that with you. <clears throat> Blessing is a funny thing. It's already here. It's ours. 
But we don't always see it, and we don't always know it, but it's ours anyways. Because that's how God is. Blessing. Always. Each of us and everyone. So please, be blessed. Feel blessing. And to those you meet in the days and weeks ahead, be blessing. That what you have received, you in turn will pass along. Go in the peace of Christ and be blessed. Amen.